Everyone talk.
I, I never read any of stuff, you know, so I didn't know. <laughs> but, you know, right? I got that and Jerry Conley. You know, it's, it's, they, they kept getting hired to see me, so I heard what the hell. They, I, they must be able to write, so I just keep offering the job. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, it, you know, it, it's really wonderful to be here. Some of you and some of you I know, but you know, also other peers, like when I published and Valley there, and great trustees, you know, and everything. I have worked with much, but admire for the years. And, there were people, and, and Joe Morrison, who worked with Joe off Captain Carrot, you know. But, uh, and God who helped you. <laughs> anyway, but anyway, uh, so, I, so it, it, it's uh, really, you know, nice, but I do have to say that it's very nice to have two or three people will get up here and thank me for, you know, Give me excessive, excessive praise for starting their careers in some ways. Maybe some ones know I had a little bit to do with it, but you know, if you you got, you know, uh, with Larry, he, you know, he was kind of a false start and then ran away. But the, and everything, you know, I'd be happy to have had, you know, more work with him, for him, with him, with him, whatever. But you know, you, if you had Larry Deuce and you got Scott Shaw and Rick Hoberg and, and uh, Marv Wolf, and you know, I mean, you know, what can you do with these guys except discover them? But they're there. They've got talent, you know. If you don't discover it, somebody else is going to do it, and then they're going to get the credit, and they're going to be standing up here, you know, or something, and whatever. So, you know, it was just a matter of maybe who did it. You know, if I hadn't, to the extent I did it, if I hadn't done it, you know, somebody else, you know, probably would. They were already there. Barb was over there at D.C. They, they couldn't move over there without stumbling over him and Len, you know. <laughs> <laughs> of course, the way we got Len and Jerry and, and Marv and a couple other people, of course, was they... I think one day they had, after doing all these mystery stories, they suddenly discovered they had like five years of inventory, <coughs> and they suddenly told them all, you know, what, just don't eat for a couple of years, and we'll buy some more stories. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and they all suddenly showed up on our, our doorstep. All I had to do was open the door, you know, really, and then, so forth, you know, so I had them right. I think your first thing was with Gene Colin, a little story about an elevator, and so forth. It worked out nice, you know. I, I, can't, I never read it, but, I take back everything. I guess I gave you Dracula because, uh, but you know, you've been writing all these mystery stories. That if they had vampires or this or that, so uh, we weren't having very good luck. I mean, Jerry did the first line, first issue of an anonymous plot, but then uh, you know, Gardner Fox that was a whole different spell school, and I love Gardner's old work, but that's what's working out too well. So I. Did. And everything, and uh, Barbara wrote these mystery stories. He's been doing stuff, you know, for uh, Warren. First thing he does with an issue or two is he created Blade, you know, who became like really the first Marvel character to make it into the movies. And everything. He didn't take Marvel off to really take care of, make, uh, you know, Dra Tomb of Dracula one of Marvel's best books. And, and uh, of course, I'm real proud of the, you know, despite all the squabbles and, tr and troubles, I was just, you know, uh, so pleased whenever I look back at uh, Captain Carrick. In fact, he was so good that I soon had him just take over the writing and Dan always said, Well, you know, he can write it better than we can anyway. So uh, you know, so I well, I certainly wrote <laughs> more more words per panel than <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, well and, 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 and of course working with uh, with Rick was great. We you know, because uh, uh, you know, not everybody would want to draw, you know, twenty or thirty characters on a page like he did. Uh, it was if it was either him or George Perez, you know. So uh, <laughs> no one knows what to it. So but anyway I just wrote a couple of comments and if there's anybody else I forgot to thank, I'm really you know, touched by the whole thing. I guess I should be happy, not a poodle rose, you know, or something. Get close sometimes. Anyway, I, I thought I'd, originally before I thought of that, I thought I'd start out with the, you know, one of the uh, Yogi Berra quotes that's always good for any occasion. You know, I want to thank all the people who made this night necessary, you know. And, uh, <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, I feel like uh, we're all here tonight because we, you know, fans, pros, or both, really, of the medium, and really because we're following the advice of uh, the eminent uh, late uh, mythologist uh, and author of uh, Hero of a Thousand Faces, Joseph Campbell, uh, who said, you know, follow your bliss. And I think that's what, you know, even those of us, those people who are the dealers are doing this, they say, oh, no, most of them, most of the people didn't get in the field because it was, they were going to make them rich. And if they did end up getting some money out of it, it wasn't because they expected to, because when, when all of us got to the field, pretty much, we felt like, well, you know, you can do this for a few years, but who knows if you can really make a living out of it over the long haul, but we wanted to do it. You know, we weren't like that first generation, 
a uh, really great artist, you know, came in about the, the 30s and 40s, who uh, had, uh, uh, you know, they, they wanted to be comic strip artists. They wanted to be uh, illustrators in magazines, or they wanted to be this and that. Most of us wanted to be comic book artists and writers. And when we would hear those horrible tales from the 50s, the Wortham and, uh, you know, Estes Keefall or the Coonskin Cat days, uh, we would, and we'd hear all the stories about hey, how Span and the, all the other people wouldn't tell people they were in comics, they'd say we're, we're publishers or we're commercial artists or whatever. You know, we, we understand because, of course, there was a social pressure that we never quite felt. But at the same time, it was hard to understand because, you know, we wanted to do this. We were proud of it. You know, we, we would tell anybody what we were. I never told anybody I was a magazine writer or a magazine editor, uh, as far as I know. Uh, you know, they might have, you know, it, 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 but we were also like Rodney Dangerfield, too. You know, we didn't get no respect. And I don't care. Nowadays, they think they do, but it's all the money, right? Because comic books started getting respect back around the time of, you know, maybe a little bit around the time, the early 60s and the time of Batman. And it's all because of headlines like Shazam, first Superman comic brings $100. You know, that was it. It was the money. You know, nobody cared what was in those things. The fact that some idiot, you know, would pay $100 or $5 for, for an old comic, 20, 30, 40 years old, with Superman or Batman. They, they would, and they would, you know, crash, bang, pow, you know, the next headline would be the other the words, all the same stuff. And of course, the great progress we've made now is, um, you know, uh, Thor Ragnarok makes half a billion dollars in two weeks worldwide. I mean, that's really the progress of the art. So it's the same thing. It's just a different version of the same thing. Um, and we're happy to see this. We're, we're happy if we get a little cut of it here and there. But uh, most of just gotten this, this thing because we um, we love it, you know. And uh, um, yeah, a couple other things. Uh, you know, you know, uh, anyway. Uh, yeah, I was going to mention that, that when they saw the newspaper, this, we always knew it wasn't about the work we did. We were thinking about, for the most part, it wasn't about the work Stan did when he got a little attention or whatever. You know, they, people just seized on it. They'd write these little articles and they'd all be the same article. You know, they might as well have just changed a couple words around on the same one, you know, and so forth. But uh, we were just happy to be in the field. Um, really, because at the end of the day, we didn't have much of a choice. I mean, we had these either stories, images, comedy, yeah. in our head. Uh, I, I bet, every, you know, I could talk to about my experience in this couple of and they would be echoed, I'm sure, in some way, certainly by every pro in the room, and probably a lot of you who, you know, have, are on the edges of it or doing something else, is that, you know, we find some stage when we were, I don't know, in my case, maybe seven or so, uh, when we would suddenly just sit down and draw a comic book. I've still got somewhere, I hope, I'm sure my mother said that I could. Uh, my first comic book, which was 50 something pages. I mean, I was, you know, I was quite ambitious from the beginning. Uh, it was Elephant Giant. It was an all giant comic. The spider yeah. Sarah, since I was so little, everybody was a giant. Elephant Giant was the main hero. They just kept stomping around with, you know, <laughs> but, uh, you know, and, and then one day, somewhere along the line, uh, suddenly there was a chance to work in Bandian because this college professor acquaintance of mine through the mail had not met him. Uh, Jerry Bales wanted to start a magazine that was all for ego. It was going to be a newsletter at first. And he wanted my help, because I was the only guy he knew, you know, uh, outside the professional world. He and I were corresponding, but he wasn't really that touch with that and any other people, so I helped him. And, you know, it's, as Stan likes to say, you know, he had that show Lucky Man in, in Britain. It's really all about luck. I mean, you know, you have to have the talent. My wife always says you have to have the talent, you know, and the drive to get in the door. And, and everything, but that's just the price of admission, you know, then once you get in, uh, you know, but you've also got to, you know, have a lot of luck, you know, and everything, and, and all of us can look back at one or two, one or two people who say I was lucky, but first, you know, I got more luck and more help, you know, I was, I was lucky that somehow Gardner Fox and Julie Schwartz, through the mail, and I can't imagine it having this happening now, so it's quite the same way, introduced me, sent me Gardner Fox's home number, home address so I could write him. And he said, well, you know, you might want to see this guy who just bought my all-star collection, Jerry Bales, and since that was the favorite comic of both. And that led to alter ego, <coughs> I think, Martin, my connection with that, which never thought I'd be in 150 issues of it <laughs> years later, but there it is. The luck of being offered a job uh, for, as a Superman uh, assistant editor, you know, because uh, I wasn't really ambitious enough back in Missouri to go looking for a job in New York. 
I mean, I, I really had no ambition at all. I, I wanted to get out of high school teaching. That was the closest thing I had to ambition. And then uh, the love that worked wisely was such a malevolent toad, as I was that that when I met Stan and he offered me or he <coughs> met him when he walked me over the phone, to take a riding test, I couldn't do this. I was calling, I was calling to try to see if I could get him taken out for a drink. And he says, well, no, I don't go out, I live on LA, I go well, I don't socialize much, but you know, if you take this right, why don't you take this writing test? <coughs> Turned out later, they had a hundred so people, there were a few old pros and other people from an ad in the paper, but he hadn't found anybody he liked. So he, uh, and you know, he liked it, and so I, you know, after eight days, I quit out of DC and went to work for him. That was luck, because Marvel being a smaller upcoming company, while I wasn't thinking about that, you know, to me it was a demotion when I went to Marvel. I mean, I wanted to do it, but it was a demotion. Uh, and certainly, DC looked at it as a demotion because they were the tendency that nobody could imagine anybody would want to go to Marvel Comics if they could work for DC Comics uh, and everything. But I was very happy. <coughs> and I was lucky because it's a small company. Stan had the office that was about two-thirds of the office space was Stan's office. And the rest of us were proud of this little thing Somewhere between an office and a closet, so I was in there with Lois Steinberg and Paul Brodsky and Steve Gates and Louise Beverly were across the hall, and that was pretty much it, you know, and everything. And uh, so, you know, I was, I was you know, very lucky, and I certainly never expected to become, you know, better than chief or whatever the title would be, because I figured Stan was never going to give that up. He had it since like 1941, you know, so, uh, and then all of a sudden he becomes publisher and president. And, I just found an energy. About the time that that kind of sours, I get a chance to go and write the Justice Society type of character is my favorite. So I, I feel very lucky. And uh, most of the really good luck I feel I've had in my life, when I think about the luckiest things, except for meeting uh, Dan, um, was uh, or about, you know, comments <coughs> about things. that. I spent a few years making some money, you know, writing movies, co-writing with Jerry Kyle and so forth. I enjoyed that. But I never, it never meant as much to the, you know, us. Uh, Bill, but uh, it never meant as much to me as the, uh, the comics. If I, if I ever had to choose between the two, you know, and everything, it would have been probably, you know, the comics that there rather than the So, anyway, um, so, you have to cover all this, I didn't even read it. So, anyway, <laughs> we're all very lucky to uh, get to do what Joseph Campbell said we should do, which is to, uh, Follow our bliss, and I know that the first time I saw that uh, quote from him, instantly, you know, I mean, I knew exactly what he meant, and he was simply expressing in his, in that three words, he was expressing what, you know, probably most of us in this room, maybe all of us in this room, have done all our lives. I mean, you know, whether it's the people I've mentioned here, and, and, and Sergio, and the great. You know, the great Sergio, the great Russ Keith over there, you know, and so forth, and some of the people who are here that we you know. So, um, I remember being at TAPS the, the founding evening. Actually, it was 40 years ago this year, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was at 76, but it was actually 77. So it was 40 years ago. And the only two things I remember, I brought my friend Claire Noto, who was co-writing some Red Sonja with me then. And I remember it was my one and only meeting with Alex Toast. <laughs> you know, and as soon as I walked up to this great, wonderful artist that I always wanted to meet, he, and I introduced myself and said, oh yes, I remember we had that little altercation a couple of years back. <laughs> because we exchanged exactly one letter, you know, but he remembered it. It was a guy that poor and grudge, you know. And then, then we shook hands and never saw each other again. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, if it hadn't been for past, I'd never had a chance to be one of that particular great comic party. So congratulations to Cass on his... Uh, 40th anniversary, and I want to thank you, all of you, you know, who, uh, you know, made this night necessary or whatever it is. <laughs> thank you very much.